Hello, pod smashers of the internet, and welcome to another episode of Stereotypid Pod Smash, where gaming goes to grab a beer. We are your hosts, Penguin and Termite. I am Penguin. I am Termite, and we are a weekly video game podcast smashing together ideas that you care about with video games. That's right, and tonight we are going to be talking about strategy guides. Remember those? Yeah, as I like to call this episode, from magazines to wikis, the evolution of strategy guides. You need to you need to message me that so that I can remember to make that the title when I go to publish the episode. <laughs> if it's something completely different, then you real, you'll you guys will know that Penguin's ADHD prevented him from reminding term. You literally <laughs> have to edit the episode. You'll hear yourself say it. I know. I'll hear myself <laughs> say all of that and still probably forget. <laughs> I promise you, this one's gonna happen. Oh, oh, I love funny. it. All right. Yeah, so we're going to talk about strategy guides, and we'll talk a little bit about history and what they look like now, and just kind of the impact the strategy guides have had on the gaming community. So let's uh, talk about that eventually as we get into our main topic. But before that, we are where gaming goes to grab a beer, so what are you drinking tonight? I am drinking uh, my final Aslind beer. Aslin. I keep putting a D in there. There's no D. It's Aslin. <laughs> A-S-L-I-N. Just like the lion from Except Narnia. Except A-S-L-A-N, but I'll let it slide. All right, cool. You can do that. This <laughs> beer that I'm drinking is called Brunchies. It's a sour IPA brewed with blueberries, maple, lemon, and coffee. And there actually is something on the can to read, which Aslin does not usually have. So I'm going to read it. Brunchies is a beer for people who really know how to live right. At 7% alcohol by volume, this sour India pale ale is brewed with blueberries, maple, lemon, and coffee in Alexandria, Virginia by Aslan Beer Company in collaboration with Troon Brewing. Keep this beer between 35 to 40 degrees. Drink fresh. That's the key to sure satisfaction for you and your friends. So it's... I guess it just describes the flavors that are in it, which are definitely that. Uh, I would That's say awesome. that's a great the, combo right there. It is. Maple goes well with coffee, blueberries, and lemon also go well together. In fact, all of these go great because one of my favorite breakfasts experiences in the world is a lemon blueberry pancake covered in maple oh. syrup with coffee. And wow, this, specific. That's so yeah, it specific. is. Like that's seriously, perfect. yeah. So when I saw this, I was like, I have to drink this because it's my favorite breakfast, but it's a beer. Yeah, it's awesome. And it's not overpoweringly sweet, which is something I look in for like whenever you get a bunch of flavors like this, does it just like taste like a candy bar or like a <laughs> bag of Sour Patch Kids like the last beer did? It has a weird like retro Brady Bunch style label that's kind of strange with like 1970s dressed folks. I don't know why. Uh, brunchies. But yep, there it is. It's like brunch in a can. It's awesome. Nice. Yeah. I am drinking a beer from one of my favorite breweries that is not from Virginia this time. And it is from Victory Brewing um, in Pennsylvania. Yes. I'm a huge fan of the Gold Monkey and the Sour Monkey and all the monkeys that they do. But this is Citrus Wit Whirlwind. And it's a very, I mean, the, the the bottle here just looks like a summer. It looks like a summer thing. And we, we are finally like, it seems like we're on the other end of the cold weather. We had a little spit of cold weather this past week, but it has come back in full force. And we were outside yesterday. It was Easter, and we were outside in the sun, hanging out with you guys. And I was just like, I'm glad I saved this for my little collection of beers from Total Wine. I'm glad I saved this one for last because it now feels like summer. I was just commenting to my, to my wife that like well, right before we went to go record our news episode for the night, it was like the perfect like pink summer twilight where it's like Ooh. more pink than purple in the the, the way I the light's that. hitting. I know exactly what you're you talking about. You know exactly about. what I'm talking about. And, and my immediate thought was like, man, well, kind of after we recorded, after our conversation about Pikmin Go, I was like, man, this would have been a perfect night to go out and play Pokemon Go. Just like walk around, catch Pokemon in the yeah. neighborhood. It would have been awesome. Anyways, so I've got summer on the brain. So this is a very summery beer. So I'm looking forward to, to giving it a taste. I'll read what the bottle says. It says, a swirl of citrus, a steady calm meets with a whirlwind of flavor with notes of grapefruit and grapefruit <laughs> in this citrus <laughs> crisp wit. It's uh, got malt of Pilsner and wheat. It's got Tetnang hops in it. And then additions of grapefruit, orange peel and coriander which makes me think a lot of like a blue moon is what i'm expecting i'm gonna take a sip oh oh it's like a blue moon but better it's like okay. um it's got, got that flavor profile that you expect in a blue moon with a little bit of that citrusy bite to it but it's got the body of like a golden monkey so it's a little bit thicker and it's not as boozy though so it's not it's only five percent alcohol instead of like 13 like a golden monkey is but definitely tastes like a victory beer i'm all about it i'm into it i want this on the shelves i want this uh beer to be on the shelves in my grocery store like golden monkey is so 
Cool. But you bought it at Total Wine. Uh, that's yeah, total, yeah exactly. So you should so be able to just go back and get more. Yes. Okay. <laughs> I want it. Total Wine's like thirty minutes from my house. Food Lion is five. Oh, that, so yes, you just want, want the convenience it. of it. At, oh, I got yeah, you. Okay. Yeah, I thought yeah, you meant yeah, like yeah. it was exclusive. Know, you couldn't <laughs> find. It. Yeah. I, I, was, no, I can totally. T- <laughs> I know exactly okay. what you mean. Yeah. You thought I was saying, but no, what right. I was saying was gotcha. I want this to be five minutes from my house instead of thirty. I want yep. to get a six pack of this right next to the Golden Monkey and the Sour Monkey that they have in the grocery store. Yeah. Fun note about the Monkey line of beers. Over the Christmas holiday, I was desperately trying to find... They had a Christmas version of Monkey, and I I think it was Merry Monkey. Mm-hmm. And I wanted to get some and send it to you and oh, then yes. have it together on the podcast for our Christmas episode, but I couldn't find it. Uh, and I didn't want to get your hopes up and like have the disappointment, so yeah. I didn't even really talk about it. It was mm-hmm. just kind of like... But I tried, and I saw it once and didn't buy it. That's how I was made aware of it. And then I went back with the and idea to try and yeah. get it. It was all gone. And uh, next was... year, next Christmas, we'll be able to record in person yeah. and take it together because this is a great transition into what I want to talk about in our little banter section here. And that is both of us got our shots, shots, Algie, shots, Algies. shots, shots, not throwing away my shot. <laughs> all of them. Let's get all the puns out. Can we, get... <laughs> we can do <laughs> can we get all the puns out now. <laughs> yes, we both uh, as of this morning, we both have received our shots. You have received your one and only dose of the Johnson and Johnson vaccine. Yep. And I will have just received my first dose of the Moderna vaccine. Mm-hmm. So I want to talk about our experiences because they're probably very different. All things considered, not just our literal experience going in to get them, but also our like like the experience of the shots and the fact that I have to get two doses. And so my gratification is a little bit more delayed than yours. But so I just want to talk about the whole thing. So I'll start and just say that, like, I guess that, you know, so I was pre-registered, right? Mm-hmm. And, you know, news dropped a couple weeks ago that the federal government wants to get this all the states to basically agree to open up vaccination to all adults by April 19th. Was it 19th or 15th? I thought it was in the federal guidance was May. I think and then each individual state was actually beating that and coming out with different dates. That right. Were in which April is why, trickling. right. Which is why then the federal government adjusted their timeline, I believe oh, to okay. mid April. Yeah. Biden gotcha. at least said, I think in mid April, Biden said that he, or sorry, a couple, like a last week or whatever. He said that he wanted to get it all done by April 15th or opened up to all adults by April 15th. Yep. So all the states have been, like you said though, all the states have been beating it. So that's when I got, you know, like basically a day later that I saw that news, I got an email saying that my County in Virginia was like ready to, you know, give me an appointment. So I, I being like, in the category of like one C or whatever, or whatever the group was, that's like, you're an IT professional. You're not going to interact with another human for another year um, anyways, or you could afford to not interact with another human for another year. Uh, I wasn't, you know, I was expecting to just get it when all of it was available to all adults. Right. Um, so yeah, being able to get, basically I was like, you can sign up an appointment now. And the earliest appointments were Monday or whatever. So I was like, sweet. But I guess again, that th- this Monday was have been like the first possible available appointment. Cause I saw, cause it was, it was cr- packed, man. Like I pulled up there. My appointment was for nine 28 this morning and mm-hmm. I didn't actually get my shot until nine 48, like almost 20 minutes later. Dang. And that was with me getting there early and getting in line. It was, I mean, it was being run about as well as it could have been given that it was like a high school gymnasium basically, but there was okay. a lot of people there and it was like, Ugh. so it was a lot and then i the other uh, little comment i wanted to make on the whole experience was there were a lot of people there that like i was thinking to myself i was like half of these people should already have had their shots because there were a lot of like men and women there that were definitely over 65 i was yeah. like why <laughs> why are you all here now and why didn't you get these like when you were uh, months ago when it was made available to you it was it was just a I don't know why I couldn't tell you. I expected, you know, mm-hmm. I was going to say if there was going to be a line, I would have expected it to be people my age. But no, it was it was a line full of people of all ages. And that was what baffled me um, very much so. But yeah, it was it was uh, other, than, other than those couple comments, though, like the place where it happened to be was like there was no Internet. There was no cell reception. So I couldn't communicate with anybody from the outside world. However, I was able to uh, I happened to schedule my appointment at the same time as my sister in law who has joined us on the podcast as Brizzle McFizzle. Nice. So we just happened to stand. So we happened to have the same appointment time. So I met her there and we stood in line and we hung out while while we went through the entire process. So That's awesome. it wasn't so unenjoyable. It wasn't completely unenjoyable. But it was definitely not what I expected because everybody else who I've talked to about this vaccine more or less who's been able to get it in groups 1A or 1B were able to like walk in and get it. You know, yeah, like five minutes. And then mm-hmm. I was sitting here being like, there's a, there's a line. This is crazy. This is intense. I, I was way later to work than I thought I was going to be, you know, scheduling my appointment at 930. Yeah. So it was, uh, yeah, it was crazy. So, hmm. 
but it's done. I've got it. So first dose, what, like 80% effective for the Moderna vaccine for yeah. the first dose. I'm not yep. at that 95% yet until I get the next shot, but like it's a good start. I'm excited mm-hmm. about it. You are correct in that I had the diametrically opposed <laughs> experience. I found out on a whim on a Friday night, 10 minutes before I actually went in, that there was a pharmac- a pharmacist who was administering walk-in vaccines for the Johnson & Johnson dose at Giant Food, which is was mine right down the street, like less than a mile away from my house. And I found out through a coworker who knows this person because they live in the same neighborhood. They're neighbors. And so he just like texted me, hey, if you're still looking for a shot, I have been pre-registered since January. I have updated my profile numerous times just to, you know, put a beep into the system that I'm still there. Uh, and one of those updates was to my BMI was 26, which technically means I'm overweight. And so I was hoping that would kind of push me forward in line. That was a more recent change after being aware that there was a group 1C that had already been opened up to. I'm like, well, being overweight kind of puts me on the threshold of 1B and 1C. So I don't feel bad. I don't feel like I'm taking somebody else's spot. Vaccines have been going out since January. It's March. So and there's I'm gonna... like four different versions. There's, you know, the AstraZeneca yeah, so got approved. Yeah. So it's like there's... So I, was there's like, I just yeah. want to get a shot. I'm going to pre-register. I'm going to update my, my BMI update to overweight to try and like maybe that'll help expedite the process. And I've heard through numerous accounts that people could go through our local hospital here in Fredericksburg is Mary Washington Hospital and register through that website. Even if you're already pre-registered, you could still try to set up an appointment with them. And wait for a callback. And people were getting callbacks in like 48 hours. Wow. So I just did that Friday afternoon at work. And then I was talking to a coworker about that. Then I come home sitting on my couch, putting the kids to bed around that whole dinner time frame. Uh, and I get this text from my other coworker who's like, hey, go to Giant. They're doing walk-ins. So I'm like, sweet. I send my wife first while I watch the kids. She goes and she's texting me her experience. There's no one there. She's the first person <laughs> to show up. There's no line, no wait. Ridiculously simple. Here's your ID. Here's your voter, your uh, insurance card, not voter registration, your insurance registration, your ID, uh, fill out some paperwork, shot, sit for 15 minutes and home. And that was it. Like it took her that whole cycle. And then I went. And at that point, I guess some word had gotten out. So there was two people in front of me. But like you said, they were elderly and they were definitely older than 65. And Mm -hmm. I was questioning why they are just now getting one. But whatever. So they were in front of me and she did all three of us. It was me, actually. I like, somehow got ahead of them. So they were there first, but they took a little longer to fill the paperwork out than I did. So I sat down, pretty much no wait at all. And I did my 15 minutes and got home. And it was Friday night, and I'm like, ready to go. And I got a shot. So it was all like super short notice, just walk in and get it. It's done. Now, you haven't woke up tomorrow yet. I haven't so I yet. We, so I don't and, know how you're going to feel tomorrow. <laughs> yeah, I I am currently feeling, so my current ex- post-shot experience in regards to, you know, any side effects, um, obviously there's a sore muscle. I got a piece of metal jammed into my into my shoulder. Like, that's going to that's gonna hurt. But, like, whatever. I've had shots before. It's fine. I felt, so the, the first time anyone checked in with me was around lunchtime. My mother-in-law was, was staying with us today, and my, my wife had the day off. And she, the, uh, my wife asked me, how are you feeling? I said, I feel great. I'm firing all cylinders everything i feel so good i felt so good at that point and then like two hours later i was on a call with a co-worker and i just suddenly re- i commented i was like dude i suddenly feel so freaking tired for no reason i was like yeah ah, shot <laughs> yep moderna hello there you are so that uh that was my only experience with that i felt pretty tired throughout the afternoon but i and i never but i never felt like achy or mm-hmm. like feverish but just because i was tired and I, I attributed to the vaccine. I went ahead and took an ibuprofen and uh, now I feel fine. So uh, yeah. we'll see if I have fever dreams or anything tonight. It's a distinct possibility um, or mm-hmm. if I wake up feeling crappy tomorrow. But in the meantime, I feel OK. And I did definitely feel something out of the ordinary this afternoon. But I feel OK since. What about you? How was your experience um, post-shot? I didn't feel anything until the next morning, but I can only equate it to the same feeling of like when I know I'm going to be sick. It was the feeling prior to being sick. It was like, I'm coming down with something. Mm-hmm. By My wife's experience was definitely worse. She had the night chills, the body aches, the fever, the whole, like she was a train wreck. Felt like she'd gotten hit by a train. She's not mm-hmm. a train wreck. Her body felt like it got <laughs> yeah. hit by a train. So she slept in. I let her sleep to like, and when I say I let her sleep, it was, I was watching the kids and manning the house and doing everything to let her rest. I sleep in till like noon or one o'clock. She enabled. Was just in and you out enabled her. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. That's I permitted my wife. <laughs> yeah. Like there's no permission. This is dumb. That's idiotic. Yeah. You're, you are correct. I what enabled my wife. Tale? Come on. Yeah. To, to sleep in and she got up 
I went for a run because I needed to cap out my weekly mileage for training. And I felt very tired and very weak while running. And I knew my pace was going to drop. My heart rate was high. Uh, but again, it was no actual like symptoms of being sick or anything. It was just tiredness and weakness. I got back, took a shower. I collapsed. I was done. Like I just looked mm-hmm. at my wife. He's like, I'm, I can't, I'm useless right now. Mm-hmm. And it was an easy run. It was short, a four mile run. It's like a half hour. And I collapsed and took like a two hour nap. I told she asked, how long will you be? And I was like, well, usually I nap for a half hour. I took a two hour nap. Wow. And after that, I, I had an energy drink and I was good to go for the rest of the day. Nice. Uh, and then just like some other mild tiredness kind of, you know, throughout Sunday. And mm-hmm. that was fine. And then today I'm tired by the end of the day, mm-hmm. but, uh, nothing out of the ordinary so yeah yeah well all that's just to say it's the beginning of the end of this era of social distancing and remote recording and all that stuff penguin and termite will be back in the studio so to speak uh in just a like a well a month and a half because now we're waiting on me (laughs) to get my second shot so yeah we've got uh my next shot is at the dominion raceway by the way which oh nice brother-in-law got his shot there and he said it's it's a complete zoo it's like oh, it no. is it is like a drive through, but like because of the traffic and all that stuff. I was like, if it's anything like today, I'm just going to dread that entire experience. I'm going to take the Ugh. day off or something because like there's no way like I'll be able to swing all that with work and everything. Yeah. Like trying to work while also having to drive down there and then back up. So, yeah, it's going to be it's going to be nuts. But other than that, uh, you know, in a, in a month and a half or so, we'll be we'll be able to do stuff person in person again. Maybe we'll do some live streams where we play some Smash Bros or something like that. We have the world is now our oyster in regards to what kinds of things we can do together. And so hopefully you guys will be the ones to benefit from all that content and to benefit from our shots. So that was that. That's why I wanted yep. to talk about it. So cool. Shots. Shots. It's a shots, brave shots, new world. <laughs> it's a brave old world. <laughs> yeah, that was. Yep. <laughs> All right, cool. Well, then that is getting a shot and being able to do stuff in person again is our favorite thing. But also doing this podcast is our favorite thing. Doing this podcast is our favorite thing. Favorite things is a segment of our show where we update you on something we have discovered or rediscovered or experienced this week and all of it we are sharing with you in hopes that you are inspired to go out and find your next favorite thing. So yeah, Termite, what's your favorite thing? I am because we are like almost 20 minutes into our show already. I will cut this one a little bit short. There was a whole story behind it, but it's irrelevant. It made me angry and I'm resetting. But what my favorite thing is, is I ordered a bookshelf. I actually ordered two bookshelves. One of them did not work. One of them did. And so I have extra bookshelves that I'm trying to take my video game collection a little more seriously. And I want to actually present it in a way that is appealing and practical. Uh, I want all of my video games to be accessible and all of the consoles to be hooked up where you can come into my collection and pick any game off the shelf and plug it into a console and play it immediately. That's the end goal. But I also want it to look visually appealing. Consequently, because we're still kind of in half work from home, remote stuff, like I want my background to be the library of video games around me. So I was looking at a space here in our studio where we would record slash my office uh, and try to do like a little wraparound situation where I can sit in the middle of my collection. So it is my favorite thing because I have one of the bookshelves ready to go and I've started adding games to it. And I've been doing a lot of research and looking up videos and things online about ideas on how to present stuff that are not uh, standard shapes, like how to present Game Boy cartridges, how to display portable consoles, how to show off boxes and artwork. And I'm I'm learning and kind of growing because I have no eye for any of this kind of home decor or presentation stuff. I, I have no eye for it whatsoever. I'm just so like utilitarian i just throw it on a shelf and go when there's so many missed opportunities to make it look visually appealing and draw the attention and have something to talk about like a talking piece especially when the world comes back to normal and folks are in and out of my home again uh it's going to be a place that i would want to hang out with friends and like play video games of the ancient years (laughs) as well as my kids and like be able to walk them through video game history and share that and pass it down to the next generation so i'm really excited about it it seems like that was a lot of words to describe my favorite thing is just a bookshelf but that's what my favorite thing is it's a bookshelf i had that same thought i was like i thought this you're gonna cut it short (laughs) so if this is short then I. oh yeah there's a whole story about the second bookshelf that i'm just not i'm skipping yeah i'm furious it's fine 
All right. My favorite thing today is I'm going to shout out to a person Ooh. and it's someone who probably is never going to listen to the podcast, but whatever, just in case anyways. So I'm going to shout out to my HR rep, Nicole. She's been awesome recently. She, you know, I had that whole situation with insurance at work and though it's still not completely resolved, like she basically owned it and so that I didn't have to. And so that was like a huge relief on me after an already stressful week. And then on top of that, I just got in the mail today a like five year gift that I wasn't expecting to get. She sent me a uh, like a pretty I'll just I won't say the amount, but I'll say a pretty sizable Amazon gift card just for you know being with the company for five years. Nice. Um, which is cool. And that's on top of like already like promotions and raises um, and you know the normal stuff you get for working for five years. So right. it's not like it was like like. <laughs> thank you for working here five years here's a gift card like it, it wasn't one of those circumstances the gift card was on top of already like the due compensation for my you know my performance and all that stuff so well, it's cool. not a, yeah so it, it, again it's um you know I, I don't always have um you know the best opinion of 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 my work and, in my company and you know i don't I'm, I'm still not exactly where i think i should be getting compensation wise i have taken they have they have taken strides forward in compensating me more fairly but it's nice when they do little things like that on top of it uh on top of you know already paying me what i should be paid and and acknowledging me for what i should for the work that i'm doing so yeah i was just i was stoked though because i was like because this is coming on the heels of the whole tv debacle i talked about a couple weeks ago um, yeah, and so that kind of softens that blow and softens that loss a little bit. Um, Does that mean you're limited to Amazon for TV purchase? Well, not necessarily. <laughs> okay. We've already talked about it. Trust me, we're having a baby this year, so we've got plenty of things we can purchase off of Amazon with that money. Oh yes, um, but nevertheless, it's still again, it's it's unexpected income that softens the loss that we had with the with the TV one way or another. So yep, enables us to buy more with it that we may not have been able to because we were using that money to buy a new tv <laughs> so yep, yep that's, that's my favorite thing so again shout out to nicole she's great if you have an hr rep as good as mine make sure you treat them well and let them know your appreciation because they have a very very kind of like obnoxious job <laughs> dealing with like the people in their company like and going to bat for them and uh for various tasks um not all hr reps are great and do it as well as mine does but if you have one like mine that does it really well Make sure you show them some appreciation every Sweet. once in a while. So that's what I'm, that's my suggestion for favorite things. Whew, which leads us to our final segment, which is <laughs> DLC. DLC stands for downloadable content. It is a segment of our show where we have a conversation you wouldn't normally have about video games. It was kind of inspired by the old age old conversation of who'd win in a fight, X character or Y character. Um, and we decided that people have that conversation all the time. So we want to have weirder conversations about video games. So in honor of our topic of strategy guides tonight, I wanted to ask you a question that I'm not sure you've ever been asked before. Um, and that is about video games. And that is, is there any game that you think that you know so well that you could write the strategy guide for? Ooh, no one never, no one has ever asked that question. And that's your problem and- for the day. If it wasn't for a conversation I had yesterday, I would have immediately said, oh, Ocarina of Time. Like, I played it so much. <laughs> yeah. And I know all the little secrets that I could totally use that as a starting point for running a guide. But then when asked the question, can you name the six dungeons as an adult Ooh. in order? I was like, what? Wait, six dungeons? There's more than six dungeons. Well, there's three as a child, and uh-huh. then there's six as an adult. Okay, so that's nine six. total, okay, but these yeah, are the six, six adult like coins that you get. Wait, from can I try it? Stages. Can I try it? Yeah, go for it, because I was stumped. I, I only came up with five. I'm forest, completely missing one. Forest. Yep. In order. Forest, fire. Yep. Yes. Water. Yep. Oh, crap. Right? <laughs> forest, fire, water, because those are the three. And then uh shadow and spirit but what's the one in between yeah. there's one in between yes thank you you got stumped at the exact <laughs> same one i did that is hilarious. no wait because there's six sages are there six yep. sages yep because the sixth one's raru who's already a sage when you get there so there's only five temples really you are right and whomever <laughs> was trolling you is wrong right huh. it's, is it six sages or seven sages if it's seven sages then we're we're both wrong I'm looking at the chapters of a walkthrough over at ZeldaDungeon.net, and you were correct. Fire. Boom! I'm sorry. Forest, fire, boom, ice, boom, water. Boom, boom, boom. So forest, there you go. You fire. Do. You know it better than you thought you did. I did, and I'm happy about this. But ice cavern, I totally skipped. It's not a dun. It's not a dungeon. It's, it's a, not really official. Not a yeah, you just, no. It's not yeah. one of the sages. It's not one of the sage yep. dungeons. Yeah. You're right. Uh-huh. Yeah. Forest, fire, water, and then there's bottom of the well, which is separate from the shadow temple. Exactly. The bottom of the well is where kid. you got the. It's it's yeah. technically one of the kid dungeons. 
wins. So yep. it's not, yeah. Mm-hmm. You go back, yeah. So forest, fire, water, shadow, spirit. Spirits in the desert. So those are the five that I got. It's not a full, du- in my estimation, it's not a full dungeon unless you get a heart container from the boss. Mm-hmm. That's kind of like my, you You may get an item in there because one could say Dampy's Grave because you get the hook shot. Right. But like, yeah, no, it's, uh, even if you get an item in it, it's only a mini dungeon. Wait, unless I thought you got has. the hook shot in the water temple. You get the long shot in the water temple, remember? It's, but it's, the it's shadow, the same thing. but bottom of the well is after the water temple. Yeah. So why would you get a lo- or a hook shot from Dom- Dompy in the graveyard? It's the first thing you do when you get when you become an adult. You go get the hook shot, and then I don't remember why you need it, but you need the hook shot to get to something. Oh, you need to get to the forest temple because you can't get to the forest temple because no, it's you on get that a bow tree. and arrow. To get no, to the forest, to temple. get to the forest temple. In the what? forest temple, you get the bow and arrow. Okay, that's that's my answer. My answer is <laughs> the you're right. The hookshot is have. before the forest temple. The hookshot's the very first thing you get. Yes, <laughs> I'm pretty sure I could write a strategy yeah. guide on our creative time. I played that game so, so much, folks, ladies and gentlemen of our audience. This is the game that I know the most about that I could start <laughs> writing a player's guide for. <laughs> so it just goes all downhill from oh, here. Man. No, yeah. actually, now that I'm thinking about it, Link's Awakening. I could probably write go. a better guide out of my head for Link's Awakening, especially because I played the remake on the Switch recently. More, mm-hmm. Way more recently than the last time I played Ocarina of Time. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, I'd go with that. How about you? What's your game? Well, uh, aside from Ocarina of Time, which we've established as uh, I've got a pretty solid grasp on, I, there's a lot that I still don't know about that game. like um or at least by memory. Like, I don't remember where you get all the pose, like all the big pose. I definitely don't remember all the heart pieces. And I only have vague memories of some of the things like this, the specific details on some of the things like the fish scales uh, Mm. or the Zora scales, I should say. And if I were to do it, I think I could, I think if you were to put me down in front of the game right now, put a gun to my head and say, do the Bigoron quest, I could do it. Right. But I don't think I could like regurgitate it right now. Every step to you. So I'd have to like feel my way through it. Um, yep. The masks too. There's like the masks. So some of the collectibles. But if like we, if I was just writing a walkthrough of the main game, pretty sure I could handle uh, yep. handle a grain of time pretty well. Another game that I have a pretty good grasp on, or at least I used to have a pretty good grasp on, was um, Diablo three. I played a mess out of Diablo three, oh, yeah. and yep. I for the most part knew like everything, all the details about the different classes and specs, and what abilities were good and what abilities weren't good. Uh, I think I could have written a pretty decent strategy guide for Diablo three, but not anymore. <laughs> Definitely nice. not anymore. Yeah. So cool. All right. Well then that was pretty good. That was pretty good DLC. That was yeah. I like that. Yeah. So that's DLC. <laughs> Let us know what your thoughts are. What are game, what are games that you know in and out so well enough that you think you could write a guide on? Um, or are there any and explain why you think there are not or what, what about your personality or brain do you think would make it difficult for you to write a strategy guide if something like that is in play as well? Because, yeah, there's all kinds of... I just can't... You know, I, it's not my... There are plenty of people I know that just don't have the brain for details like I do. Like, I'm my brain's like, details, details, details. If I'm into something, I just remember all the details. And not everybody's brain works like that. So some people will probably be like, yeah, I could never write any guide because my brain just doesn't work like that. <laughs> so, yep. yep. Cool. We want to hear those thoughts and more. And Termite, where can the Pod Smashers or listeners otherwise could find find ways by which to express those thoughts to us? The best place you can go is 80bitpodsmash.com. That's our landing website with links to all of our podcast platforms as well as our social media outlets. And there's links to our twitch.tv slash 80bitpodsmash Twitch channel as well as our Discord server link in all of our show notes. So I think that covers every aspect of social media and internet presence that we we are so go to the 80 bitpodsmashcom find whichever podcast platform you like click on that link and get there subscribe to it if we are not on a platform you would like us to be let us know and we'll put ourselves there our rss feed is available that you can throw into any third party app for your convenience and you can also find all of our social media stuff facebook instagram twitter and reddit we have a subreddit you can start a topic and interact with our community there and then on twitch.tv slash 80 pod smash we go live every monday evening at 8 p.m for a new show and every wednesday evening at 8 p.m these are eastern times western no eastern times they're wednesdays eastern. <laughs> 8 p.m for a live gameplay stream i was mixing up wednesday and eastern and i said western and that's dumb i'm <laughs> sorry so Eastern time, 8 p.m., Monday and Wednesday. Monday night is a new show. Wednesday night is a live gameplay stream where you and I usually switch back and forth playing a game that we dig. But because we got shots in a couple of weeks, we're going to be changing all that up and maybe doing some things in person in front of a camera or like, you know, doing things together more often. So drinking, who heavily. knows? 
<laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> to celebrate the end of an era. So uh, go hit us up on social media. Give us your thoughts, comments, questions, concerns, and ideas, and interaction however you would like. So there you have right. it. Let's talk about strategy guides. Let's do it. All one right. of the most beloved pieces of artwork in video game history. Oh, yeah. One of the, just an ancient relic something, but it's not gone, as we'll talk about. It's the, the idea of the strategy guide has just changed. It hasn't. It's like the dinosaurs evolving into birds. The birds are still around. They're just, it's different. So we'll yep. talk about all of that. But first, we want to talk, what is a strategy guide for, you know, we don't want to, part of the vision for our podcast is we don't want to make assumptions that everybody who listens to our show is a gamer. So you might not know what this idea of a strategy guide is. So it's not, we're not intending to condescend. Instead, we are just trying, intending to uh, assume that, you know, anybody who's listening could be on a different level than uh, anybody else. So we'll start with thus the basic. What do we, what is a strategy guide? What do we mean by strategy guide? And then we'll talk a little bit about the history where they come from, the origins of strategy guides. Yeah, I think defining what we're talking about with strategy guides is important because there's a generational yeah. gap. Yeah. And that's a huge thing. So yeah. what we just, what we think of immediately when we hear the words strategy guide is probably different than what a Gen Z person would think oh, of. Oh, for sure. hundred yeah, percent. Like, and we'll explain why that's the case. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So that that's the meat of our topic. So what is a strategy guide as far as what we're talking about? Back in my I'm talking day. About, <laughs> yeah. Back in my day, I'm thinking about the book that was a separate purchase that would come out alongside of a video game that had all of the details of that game. Stuff like, I have a list, a complete walkthrough with maps, character definitions, a list of enemies, the story, a checklist of items, ways to cheat, or any combination of those things. Not necessarily, that's not the all-encompassing Yeah, not necessarily list. all of them, but yeah. Right. Do you remember uh, the so, GameStop spiel? Like no, the what was the, the GameStop spiel? The spiel, I would hear it every time I'd go get a game, or yeah. I'd go with my parents to get a game, and it was like, it was like, do you want to buy the game with the guide, or do you want to buy a guide with the game? If you buy the guide with the game, you get 10% off both the game and the guide, or something like that. Oh! <laughs> the whole spiel. Wow. Every time, it's still ingrained in my memory now. <laughs> Yeah, I do remember that. Right? That was like late GameCube, PS2, uh -huh, Xbox, into 360 yeah. and PS3 times. Right before the dawn of the internet that would come by and ruin everything, as we'll talk about. Wow. But it is, yeah, you, like, That's you some remember cobweb that. right there. Right? Yep. <laughs> like just saying it, like jolts that you remember it. Like, it did. Guide with the game, buy the guide with the game. Like that marketing yes. there, buy the guide with the game. <laughs> Please give us money, says GameStop. <laughs> <laughs> They, these strategy guides still exist today. Like there's a Cyberpunk 2077 guide. They're far and few between, and they're definitely not marketed as heavy as they were back then. Uh, mm -hmm. So that's what we mean when we see like strategy guide. It's like a, a big, thick magazine-esque style book. The collector's editions would usually have like hardcover versions, and there'd be softcover versions of them as well. They had tons and tons of artwork. They were, uh, again, tons released artwork, alongside the yeah. game. Mm -hmm. um, and really, really cool. So that's that's what a strategy guide is. It was great that, that's what we're talking back about. in. It was great and necessary. Not necessary as in, like, you had to have one to, to enjoy the games. Because obviously, you know, we were kids. We couldn't, you usually couldn't afford the strategy guide. And if we got a strategy guide, it was usually, like, a Christmas present with the game um mm -hmm. that we got I, I i'm only speaking from experience i should say maybe yep. maybe some of our peers were just rich kids that they always get all the strategy guides <laughs> in which case <laughs> i'm not crapping on that like that's probably an awesome collection now if you were able to afford that like cherish that but uh but yeah they were they were a way for developers to pass on information to players pre-internet and it was a way for players and and especially you know kids our age to like like oh this guy's got the guide like can, can i have him look up like it was you know you you're networking with your friends over over like information out of the guide from you know what i mean like mm -hmm. pre-internet before it was as simple as just googling the answers to your questions so yeah they were they were definitely a pretty critical part of the gaming ecosystem in the 90s so piggybacking off of that where did they come from when did they uh how what was the origin of strategy guides uh definitely in the 90s i didn't realize this until i did some research but in 1990 Pri prima games it was the first kind of big publisher for video game strategies uh -huh. came out with a book called the secrets of the games and I, I didn't realize that how early that Prima Games had started. And that was kind of a giant like collection of strategies across various games and various consoles. It was very third party. It was just, it covered kind of everything. Uh, and then in 1991, Nintendo Power had already established its magazine in the 80s. And as an offshoot of its magazine, they had the official strategy guides by Nintendo Power. And that started in 1991. And I do believe it was Mario, it was either Mario Mania. I don't remember the exact word. 
Uh, it was a strategy guide specifically focused on the original Mario games, and its follow-up was for Mario World. Uh, and they had some other stuff too, but that lasted through 2007. So 1991 is when Nintendo Power started. And then in 1993... Brady Games started as a competitor with Prima Games and Nintendo Power and started making its own strategy ga- or strategy guides for various games. So you could go into a store and you would mm-hmm. see like three different guides for a specific game if it was a Nintendo game. If it was not a Nintendo game, you'd probably see two. Mm-hmm. And those two guides would be Prima Games and Brady Games. So two big companies. In 2015, Brady merged with Prima. <laughs> so that happened like wow i can't believe it's six years ago yeah uh and then in 2018 prima games the merger of the two big companies i'm sorry 2007 let me rewind the clock a little bit 2007 nintendo power announced they didn't even announce it but they basically just stopped making guides 2007 Mm -hmm. yeah and then in 2015 prima games and brady games merged 2018 that merged company decided to announce their closing and then in 2019 in march they were officially end and that's the end of modern mainstream players guides as we know it there's a new company called piggyback interactive that I don't know what year they started, but they're still publishing guides. And like that Cyberpunk 2077 guide I mm-hmm. mentioned earlier is published by Piggyback Interactive, a company that's still kind of making game guides, but not mainstream. So yeah, so 2019 gonna... was really the end of the mainstream player's guide mm-hmm. era. Yeah. So I want to, I'm actually going to reorder the questions here just a little bit and we'll yep. come back to the next question. But I wanted to ask, since this kind of deals with the history of it, is kind of uh, the piece here. What happened if they if they stop if they stop if they were su- if they were such a huge part of the gaming ecosystem, an important part as we talked about, and now they're not now to the point where the companies that were making them, the the top you know companies that were making strategy guides, uh, are no longer. They've closed down. Why? What happened? I think the answer is obvious. <laughs> yeah, I mean the, the move to digital, of course, was that in the right. internet, the internet, uh, yeah, and the, the fan fan made guides. Why pay? 20 extra dollars for a strategy guide when all of that information is available for free at the tip of your fingers with your cell phone on the internet. <laughs> yeah. That's one aspect of the entire industry that's more obvious. The not so obvious side as to why guides stopped coming out what they did was because these players guides to get them written required early builds of games and in an era where we have the internet that can patch games so frequently and even have a day one patch that can substantially change things especially the way it looks when you have these original guides the whole like idea was you would have people next to the developers alongside the development cycle making the guide so that they could both be released on release day and be complete and that was pre-patch days like when a super nintendo game or a gamecube game ps2 they weren't hooked up to the internet. The games didn't change. And so they, the artwork, the screenshots, the development cycle that had to go with the guide, the actual writing of the walkthrough of, of the levels, those things were more set in stone early enough in the development cycle that the guides could be written. But as we moved to the digital age where things can change on a dime, including big stuff like level design or even the graphics and the rendering or even just new content, writing, like imagine trying uh, to write a strategy guide for World of Warcraft. Like, right. That you, too. Yeah, and there was to, the, yeah, Prima mm-hmm. Games has those. I have some of those. Yeah. And they are outdated day one. Yeah. Uh, and so yeah. that like shows. So. It's one thing for, yes, we've moved to the internet. It's way easier for consumers to just go to YouTube or like look at GameFAQs.com, which is throughout the 90s. A lot of people got their jobs in the gaming industry starting by writing guides on Mm -hmm. GameFAQs. But there's that whole other side that doesn't really get discovered that I want to explore more is that whole like dev cycle that took place under this, like behind the scenes. No one really knew what was going on. You go buy a game on release day and you'd see this gorgeous like cover to cover all the game artwork and all these screenshots just beautifully written complete from cover to cover everything's there right off the bat and and that's why i think it became non-cost effective it became expensive and an impossible hurdle was to stay up to date so that you can release a guide like that on release day it was impossible yeah because everything about the development cycle the games changed yep for sure yep yep and like yeah and, and now you know development cycles are so much longer and more in depth that like i i can't imagine i couldn't imagine that being a thing that happens still today you know what i mean like if they were with the way the games are made now it's like having someone sit there and write a strategy guide for a five-year dev cycle mm. (laughs) yeah and like the idea of printing a strategy guide is pretty concrete like that's not going to change it takes this much time to write this much stuff take this much screenshots and print it get it published get it through all of its like red tape to get it out like that's not going to change 
what did change was how video games go through that process. Mm -hmm. And video games themselves are now making massive changes really, really close to release. Yeah. And that's just the norm. That's just what happens. Mm -hmm. And so, like, that has kind of disconnected the timelines between writing a player's guide or strategy guide and publishing a game. Mm -hmm. And that, that was probably the impetus that led to a decrease in the desire to make the strategy guides, which then... You know, the companies, the DK Publishing was kind of the parent company to Brady and Prima Games when they made a decision to just end this. It's like, this just isn't going to work. It's too hard. It's an insurmountable problem. And the games are constantly, like, the games are changing, and our our biggest competitor now is free information on the internet. Yeah, right. (laughs) It's like, sales going down. Everything was against them. Exactly, yep, 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 exactly. Mm -hmm. So, cool. Well, whether the strategy guides are so basically what then happened is that strategy guides basically moved online whether it was a full comprehensive strategy guide old style or whether it was something like just individual guides like you can now go online and find all of the components that were formerly all packaged together in one magazine basically um now if you're like the only info i want is the trophy guide the only info i want is the walkthrough the only info i want is a guide for beginners i want a build guide whatever it is i want to know about this item like you can now pretty much look up all the individual components online because they've split up now um Mm -hmm. the landscape of the quote strategy guide or online resource is you know rather the form it takes is these online resources that have totally different focuses and bents depending on what information or or what kind of information they're trying to convey about what particular game Mm -hmm. so so yeah but whether or not it's online or in a magazine there's several like like shared components and i wanted to kind of break down like like what the different components of strategy guides or online resources are, like what is the kind of information that they're covering and conveying and how do those different types of information differ from one another? So let's walk through some of those. Let's walk through some of those. Hey, puns intended all around. Exactly. One of the most common pieces of information that strategy guides cover is the idea of the walkthrough. Um, and that is like point A to point B to point C to point Z. You know what I mean? Like all the way through each and every dungeon turn here, get this chest. When you see this, do this like those strategy guides in back in the day, the strategy guides had screenshots printed in them. Mm-hmm. Nowadays they'll, they will either have screenshots or just be lists online, or you can watch videos on YouTube that are walkthroughs. So there's a whole different, yep. different types of ways to do walkthroughs. But the general idea is go here, do this, go here, do this, go here, do this all the way throughout the entire game. Yep. What is your thoughts on walkthroughs? <laughs> yeah, they're they're kind of like the stuff. That's the core. That's the meat and potatoes of a of a good strategy guide was the walkthrough, and it would usually have all of the collectibles as you would see them in order, mm-hmm. and it would also have the boss strategies and a warning about what enemies. I'm like I'm thinking specifically of some early Final Fantasy guides mm-hmm. where it was like. In this section, look out for these chests over here. Make sure you hit the shop and get right. these new You'll gear want characters you can get. with fire equipped because you're going to f- encounter a bunch of enemies weak to fire. <laughs> yep. Yeah. And it would be like, here's this boss, how much HP, stats, defense. You know, make sure you build your characters in this way, have this armor on, you know, build them all that way. That was kind of like the walkthrough. And I loved the all encompassing 100% walkthrough. Those were awesome. Yeah, they still exist online these days, so you can yep. still find those. Walkthroughs are like a blessing and a curse, right? Because on the one hand, uh, and it all depends on your personality, your perspective, and what you're trying to get out of the game. I generally try to play games... It depends on what I'm trying to get out of it, right? Like, if I'm trying to get a Platinum Trophy, and the game is notoriously difficult to get the Platinum Trophy on, I'll look up a walkthrough to get me beat by beat. Uh, the greatest example of that's Persona 5. I didn't want to try to figure out every single thing that I was supposed to do every single day. So I looked up a walk. I just followed a walkthrough and was yep. happy was content about it. There are other games where I'm like, I kind of want the, the, the spirit of exploration and discovery. But in those cases, perhaps if I'm either not going for the trophy because it's too, too hard, or if I'm going for the trophy, but it's like one of those things where it's like, it's not, you can go back and clean up things later. Like Horizon Zero Dawn's a great example. I was able to just sort of, enjoy that game for what it was and then at the end i did a clean i looked up a guide to get all the cleanups on the collectibles and stuff but i didn't look up a walkthrough for the like story or anything like that i just sort of let that be so yeah they're definitely it depends on what you know some people are going to want to walk through for everything and just not have the stress of trying to fit having to figure things out other people are going to be like i don't want to touch the walkthrough i want to go into this experience completely virgin or whatever and there's people like presumably you and me in the middle who are like yeah sometimes i'll use the walkthrough sometimes i won't <laughs> mm-hmm so, yep, that's kind of the, the walkthroughs. In addition to walkthroughs, before, usually before the walkthrough in the old strategy guides, they'd have sort of these how-to guides. There was basic tips and tricks and how to how to use the controls, what each button did, 
ex- brief explanation of some of the basic systems in the game, um, and those still exist today. A lot of those are in the forms of beginner guides. You know, I could look. I look. I usually look up uh, like beginner beginner's guide to the Souls games because I want to know what are some of the major systems at play, what I should be looking out for. Um, and those I think can be very useful. They can also be something that a lot of people just skip past because they're not interested. You know what I mean? Like expert veteran players are probably going to be like, I don't care. I know how to do this already. Mm-hmm. But they have their place. So, what are your thoughts on how to guides or beginners tips or whatever tips? I like and tricks? I like the how to guides. It's like look out. I, and we see them today in headlines that are like, what I wish I'd known when yeah, I started. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh-huh. It's like Breath of the Wild. We have to talk about Breath of the Wild every episode of, course, of this podcast because yeah. mm-hmm. that's what we do. Contract. Uh, there's so much going on in Breath of the Wild when it comes to crafting and like weapons are destructible and like where to get armor and how to traverse the world. That there's like simple how to guides about it just breaks some of the general game mechanics, how to approach the game at a meta level, not, not the physical like move left joystick press a no, not not that like how do you craft what's the purpose of it where do you find ingredients here's some basic recipes and combinations you should know and then you go on and outriders is a modern example of what i would like to see in a how-to guide i've not looked one up but it would be nice to know like these general abilities for this class go well together look out for this build your characters in this way kind of just getting you started right. and lots of games like into... that too it's like it's good to know what stats are, are useful and what stats you know may need to be retuned by the developers so at this point the stats are useless you know what i mean like yep or this stat doesn't quite work the way you think it does um, or surprisingly this stat actually works really well like so those that kind of stuff is also very useful and you know in the old strategy guides you didn't usually get that even in the sort of tips and tricks section or how-to guides like it usually it was literally just like press a to do this <laughs> yeah this is the difference between a strong attack and a smash attack a tilt attack and a smash attack or whatever like <laughs> that's about it is what you mm-hmm. usually get you wouldn't necessarily get all that in-depth guide that now the internet allows and enables cool but bestiaries or boss guides are kind of the other uh side of that coin too where you have specific strategies and details on specific bosses these you know i remember these from the old zelda like from the old ocarina of time guide i remember like you beat this boss by doing this it was as simple as that back in the day and then you have game then i would move on to games more complex like world of warcraft where i would in that case i'd have to go to online resources to look up very detailed strategies about how your group would have to work together and what mechanics to avoid in order to fight some of these bosses. But they are cut from the same cloth. It's the idea of taking a specific encounter, a specific enemy or group of enemies, and giving you all the details you need to be as successful and efficient and effective as possible with the tools you have in the game. These were probably like the least used for me sections of the guides, but were handy in games like Final Fantasy Tactics Mm -hmm. when there would be a specific enemy that you care about, you would use as a reference. You'd be like, oh, what does a Bahamut do? Let me look at this, or the Chimera with the three heads let me look at their weaknesses and like this specific flavor of enemy and find what their hp is and like use that to form a strategy because the walkthrough would say you know for this fight here's the here's the overall like beats of the combination of enemies but to get like details about each individual enemy you would go check the bestiary and and get that reference rpgs players guides for rpgs were like this was awesome to go look at as a reference Mm kind of silly i guess for things like devil may cry or like you know your more action platformy stuff it's like oh this enemy flies in this pattern maybe that's helpful for you and what i always liked about b series more than anything else was the artwork yeah i loved looking at the 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 concept art Uh around each drawing because it looked different than how it was rendered back in the day when we didn't have amazing computers to render stuff right they helped you fill in the imagination of what the what the designers intended (laughs) yep (laughs) definitely exactly yep Mm -hmm. cool collectible guides is another component these are this is the bread and butter for the trophy hunters right (laughs) and this is the i want to talk about i mean collectible guides are what, what they sound like they will tell you the locations and like basic how to get all the collectibles Mm-hmm. and sometimes sometimes they were built into the walkthrough sometimes not sometimes they're an entirely separate guide i'm yep. pretty sure the zelda guides included them separately they wouldn't tell you in the walkthrough is just how to mostly beat the story yeah the collectible the guide puzzles. was that yeah exactly yeah the collectible guide was like oh and then if you go back you can get these collectibles mm-hmm. the thing i like about collect so my opinion of collectible guides has probably changed more than any other piece on this list um mm-hmm. and that is because i've become a trophy hunter in the last few years yeah and you care did. about care about them more and it's the one i am now most excited to see continue to evolve because the next step in collectible guides is what we're seeing with what playstation's implementing with with the you know the video collectible walkthroughs in built into 
the game interface where you can just yeah. be like, you know, I want to get this next. I want to see what all the collectibles are in this level. Like you can do it in Astro's Playroom. It's probably the only example I've seen it fully implemented and fully realized in. But just being mm-hmm. able to pull it up within the game interface of the system you're playing on. You don't have to pull up your phone. You don't have to watch some weird YouTube video with ads. You just do it in the system. Boom. That's how you get the next collectible. Amazing. I love it. So it's a, it's a, it's an area that needs some innovation, but we're starting to see it. And I just really hope it catches on. Mm-hmm. I think as uh, yeah, as just playroom, but also Sackboy. boy, sack boy did it, but I didn't play. Yeah. Too. Big adventure. <laughs> and I do think one of the newer titles is, did that one of the enhancement, it may have been crash. I'm not sure which one it was. Hmm. So it's not, it's not forgotten. Although it's not, also, it's not highlighted enough. It's not ubiquitous it, yet, and it should—it yeah, really should, it should be. be. I really wish yeah. they had done more with it with Demon Souls. Demon Souls is a game that could have greatly benefited. The Souls series in general is a is a franchise that could, or it's a it's a genre that they have a lot of really obscure like weapon locations and stuff like that. They could benefit greatly from having that kind of thing built into the game. Although, then again, that may run antithetical to the, its you know hard challenging, but like it, that information's it's not a, it's not like something that constantly changes. It's not like it randomly generates all the locations of the stuff to make it challenging. Like right. once the information is discovered, it's online for everybody. So like everybody can just go in and get a guide. So <laughs> to figure it out, you know what I mean? So it's it's one of those things where it's like I could understand on the one hand then saying let's keep the challenge and difficulty and not implement that. But on the other hand, it's like but it's just going to become widely known and uh, and easily accessible anyway. So why not just make it even eat more easily accessible it's not going to break the difficulty of the game the game is challenging because of the combat not because all the various things you have to collect mm. <laughs> so that was that's my little two cents um on that but um yep. yeah collectible guides i think are really cool i have a love this. hate relationship with collectible guides because while i'm a trophy hunter and need them desperately i always find that i'm not in the exact same situation that the guide is i'm watching or reading is doing especially if i'm replaying a specific section the it, it's always there's a couple of caveats and getchas. Uh, yeah. If games don't track which collectibles you have, but you know you've missed one from this oh. whole level, then oh. you're stuck doing every single collectible because you don't know which one you've missed. Yeah, and that's so a, that drives me insane. Pain. That's, so that's just again another aspect of it. You know, there they, the PS5 now has that functionality to track. Yep. More games just need to include it. Um, mm-hmm. But oh, they desperately need to include it, man. I was doing some. Um, I was doing. It wasn't collectible so much as just like tasks you have to do. But I was doing some gr- like things where you have to grind out some specific tasks in Kingdoms of Amalur, the platinum trophy I just got this past weekend. Yay. And um, and that was totally like I want to be able to track this so bad because I don't know how many of these freaking birds I haven't killed. You know what I mean? Like yep. I need to kill fifty of these birds, and I I think I'm close, but I don't know for sure. And it just would give me peace of mind to know that the way I'm killing them counts because there's so many games that have bugs where it's like, oh, if you do this, it doesn't count. You know what I mean? Uh, yep. So, yeah, they definitely, yeah, more of that needs to be included. And My it specifically applies to collectibles. Negative collectible guide experience the most is probably Mario Sunshine that I remember that was the most traumatic because there's <laughs> these blue coins that exist in the world that you can't get all of them on the first playthrough. So you can't do, you can't follow the walkthrough and get blue coins because you can't get them all. But there's also no in-game tracking of which ones you've got and which ones you didn't. Now, the Nintendo Power Player's Guide had a checklist that you could pull out of the back and check. But I'm never going to put a pen or a marker to my glorious, amazing, brand new, pristine strategy guide. You best believe I'm not going to draw or write in my mm-hmm. strategy guide. So I'm not doing that. And I didn't have a scanner to make a copy and like a paper copy to use. So I would try to get everything on the first playthrough and I would get some blue coins. But if I'm doing that at level one, 30 hours later, I'm not going to remember which blue coins I got. So then in subsequent playthroughs, I would just not get any of the blue coins. And then therefore I never... I never did it. I've, I've never like replayed Mario Sunshine to 100% because the game is crazy hard and it, yeah. I just never was motivated enough to play through the entire game. So like that's where it started for me with the and that was before trophies. That was before then. And we still see the same pain points in games like Uncharted where you have to get all the treasures, but you don't know which ones you got. You just know you have five out of seven. And you're like, well, which two am I missing? And later games have gotten better at like creating a menu where you can go through and figure out exactly which one you're missing and then go find a video guide on how to get it. But anyway, lots to talk about with collectible guides. A lot of of possible part and parcel with trophies and collectibles in general, but yeah, yeah, but they're, they're still a part. They're still a big part of the, you know, strategy guide ecosystem, so to say, but a couple others, uh, there's obviously some strategy guides will contain store story and lore. And we now see that even more robustly and in depth online, because people can, you know, once they've experienced all the lore in the game, they can go do a whole write-up on it. There are now videos. Um, but even in, back in the day, the old strategy guides would include some of the story 
context for players who maybe hadn't who maybe hadn't played it before or um just wanted more more to experience more of it from within and this kind of goes again this kind of segues nicely into the idea of you know one of the ways this has evolved in the online space is the idea of the wiki and it's kind of its own new type of strategy guide and probably the most advanced version of the strategy so to speak spirit of the strategy guide that we used to see and the wiki again it's based entirely off the idea of wikipedia where it's like it's it's a collection of articles that is all linked together through hyperlinks so you can go in and be like and i would i would even include power picks in a lot of ways in 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 this kind of category it's not quite a wiki but it's the same idea of it'll be like here's all the things you need to know and then here's guides to specific more break detailed breakdowns um and it's all Mm -hmm. done through hyperlinks so you can pull up all the information you need but you know, I think of uh, there's a site called Fexter Life that has they, they do all the Souls games, basically. And they have both they have both breakdowns of the lore and story in Wikipedia, like wiki article form and detailed breakdowns of all the encounters and walkthroughs. And it's all tied together in one huge site. And it's probably the closest experience online to the old school strategy guides hmm. because it's all again, the idea of the wiki is is it is a collection of info of all the information possible on the game, build guides, everything like that. And uh, do you remember a travesty of a player's guide that exists to this day where a third of the guides content was stripped away to the internet and the guide was printed with the URL or a code that you had to type into the website. Is this Destiny? You know what game I'm talking about? No, older. Uh, I don't know. It was Final Fantasy IX. Oh. It was one of the worst <laughs> strategy guides ever written. And on the sidebar, there was this whole play online pop-up so to speak, that had a whole blurb about where to go to find the rest of the information online. It was sickening, disgusting, and absolute trash to have half of your players got you spent money on ripped away and whisked to the internet where I could not get it because our family didn't have internet connection. So Mm -hmm. it was a useless guide, completely. Pretty, had some art in it, but trash. Sorry, I just I can't have an entire episode about strategy guides and let that one go. <laughs> yeah, but that is enough. kind of ubiquitously accepted in the industry as a terrible player's guide, a horrible strategy, and it never happened again. So mm. it must have bit them pretty hard. Yeah, I wanted to take a little bit of time to allow you and me to do some shout outs to some of our favorite strategy resources, whether they're strategy guides themselves, Brady or Prima. We talked a lot about Brady and Prima, obviously, but you can shout them out if you want to, if you've got a lot of value out of them. But more interested in like, what are some resources that you use online now these days uh, that are that are essentially strategy guide resources for various games? I'll say that we we already talked a little bit about power picks. I love I, I, I'm with you. You and I both use power picks whenever we can for trophy guides. Yep. Fexter Life is the one that I found completely saved my didn't completely save my entire Soulsborne experience or entire Souls like experience. But I would credit Fexter Life. Uh, I would credit my friend Justin for saving that like those ga- like getting me into those games. Fexter Life is what got me into platinuming those games because the detailed breakdowns they have of everything on Fexter Life is freaking amazing for those games. And the way he the way he compiles or the way that their team compiles that information is always like exactly the way my brain thinks. So I'm totally into Fexter Life's guides um, for Souls like games. Um, And um, I guess I'll say uh, DiabloFans.com back in my Diablo three days. uh, Oh, yeah, it's it's it's, it's defunct now. They stopped making guides like they stopped. They, they like shut down shop, unfortunately, but they had the best collection of like player, like they had the best interface for build guides and the way that, so the players could put together their own very detailed, all the information you need as to how to build out your characters. And mm-hmm. it was awesome. So all those are the kind of some that I want to shout out. I use for trophy hunting very much PS5 trophies as a channel name. He was okay. not always called PS5 trophies. He renamed it when the PS5 came out, but his name is Brian. And so he has a Twitter account as well. Uh, and every time new big games come out, he comes up with videos and it's a collection of short videos, usually one small video covering each trophy. And sometimes there's an overarching platinum guide that just hits at all of the things you should watch out for as you play to give you the platinum. And of course, I use that alongside power picks because uh, they're very similar in how they approach yeah, like, collectibles nice. and uh-huh. stuff. So his name is Brian English. His Twitter handle is at PS5 trophies underscore. And I guess because somebody else grabbed it. He used to go by PS4 trophies. So you might find him that way too. All one word. Sweet. I'll check so, that out. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah, he's awesome. I've been using him ever since. In fact, his voice is unique. And sometimes his voice gets stuck in my head. It's weird. <laughs> it's, a, it's a thing. You hear uh, him especially in sleep. the early days when I was using him for like Uncharted collectibles and stuff. Fantastic resource. If I'm playing a Zelda game, go to zeldadungeon.net. 
and it's an all-encompassing every single Zelda game ever made with full 100% walkthroughs uh, from beginning to end, step by step, to get every item as early as possible in the game that you're allowed to get, given the constraints of the linearity of, of the unlocks and the uh, like, how areas become unlocked, uh, that reduces backtracking. So as much as possible it's it's like every heart piece every sort of thing you can do in the game if there's a trading sequence like in the the big goron sword or in link's awakening the guide has you covered or uh, all of them and, and that, I, that's my ubiquitous place for all things zelda nice. i will just go straight to zelda dungeon.net and i will follow the guide with pictures my favorite is a text-based guide with screenshots that's my absolute favorite. That's yeah. how my brain mm-hmm. works. That's what I want. Yeah. I don't. I hate watching videos for walkthroughs because I have to watch the video and then play it and, and then I'm do doubling it and my doubles the time. Oh yeah, yeah, hundred yeah. percent. Yeah, and I can't stand. That's it. That's why so, I like the idea of it being built in because at least you can then remove the like looking at your phone or looking at your computer piece of it. You can just be like, show me this, and then yeah. a, like a five second clip. So it's still kind of doubles the play time, but you don't have the extra like having to watch an ad or all that nonsense, uh, yep. or getting distracted by someone chatting you on your phone. Like it's just built in, allows you to focus focus and streamline it more but mm-hmm. i'm with you yeah definitely uh definitely like text and and, and it depends on what i'm looking for too and and i also like the idea of like having links that's why i like the wiki format because i like having it be like here's this thing and like it may not be relevant to the moment i'm doing but it may be referring to a boss that's coming up and so i might want to like click on that to see more information on the boss yeah that's that that's the added piece that my my brain works but um in my last resource uh-huh. and i'm with you is playstation trophies.org has fantastic breakdown of trophy guides for various games. And that gives you the difficulty, the length of time to platinum, and pretty much power picks-ish, but it's community forum as well. So I'm actually trying to find an example of one now. There's a whole guides list, and it's like tons and tons of games. But like I'll use Control as an example, because it should be... I can't find it, because there's a lot, unless I search for it. Anyway, it's there, but it'll give you... If you just Google like any game Control uh, trophy guide, it's usually PlayStation Trophies dot com or dot mm-hmm. org is going to be in that list. Uh, Power picks, PSN profiles, and it's the third entry right there. PlayStation Trophies dot mm-hmm. yeah. org There's gives you a well. trophy guide and roadmap with, like I said, the estimated difficulty, the length of time to platinum, how many playthroughs, is there anything missable? Like right off the top, just to get you. I do this with every single game I'm going to play on anything PlayStation. So nice. that's yeah, it's good. Cool. That's awesome. what I do. I have yep. one more question, and we don't have time to really break it down, but I just want to ask, do you think we'll ever see another monumental shift in strategy guide? Like the idea of strategy guides, do you think we'll see another monumental shift as we did with the internet? Or do you think that, that, that this is the new norm and it's going to be what it is even, you know, 10, 15 years in the future. There's, it's actually not going to be another shift, but it will continue to decrease as games as a service becomes more normal. And as things like the PlayStation 5 UI that allows you to have like little clips of videos in, instilled in the UI, like baked in, the, uh, like the idea of even a website that gives you strategy guides could go away. And mm-hmm. so I don't, I don't think there'll be another shift. I think that the, the next piece continue. of technology that would maybe have some kind of big impact on that in the same way the internet did, completely changing the dynamic, at least the way you access the information. I think AR has a very high possibility. Imagine having like a pair of glasses you put on that are gaming glasses that have a- AR technology where it's like you see a thing in the game you want to know more about it you do something you know uh, and then it pulls up more information about what you're literally seeing in front of your face like that I think would be the next like big leap maybe not as monumental and groundbreaking as the internet but it would be the next big iteration of that same idea of like ease to access and ease to like contextualize it within the game because like again you, the game could like the, or the AR could be hooked into the game detect where you are in the story and you know Hey, I want to know more about this trophy. Oh, you know, it's missable because you're already you've already, you know, m- messed it up or it could give you a warning about missable coming up, you know what I mean? Like things where it's like you've got some kind of extra layer there that is helping you based on the context. You know, imagine if it was like trophy this way or like a, tr- a collectible this way and then gave you like do you want a heads up display? Like do you want a walkthrough? Like do you want the, you know, do you want the your AR to light up and show you where to go? I think that has a lot of potential for like strategy um, helping people and stuff like that. I think that makes sense in a VR space, but that would be a hard sell for something that's not like an extra peripheral, an extra piece of glasses and a whole software library API and like to support. And that that's not really realistic, the AR solution, but that exact solution is totally viable in a VR VR situation. Yeah. Uh. Yeah. I could see it going both ways. Uh, yeah, I could see it going both ways. I think there are ways that you could do it with... Um, I think gamers are more likely to buy peripherals than like your average person. I think the if Google Glass had been implemented as a gaming component first, 
I think it would have probably been more widely accepted then. Because if you're just wearing it while gaming, like you're already grabbing your controller and getting, you know, just you hook it into your controller, boom, you hook it, you put it on, and then if it were like an AR solution for I'd gaming, right? Exactly. That's what I'm saying. Is like I think gamers are more willing to accept peripherals than like your average person out on the street. So I, I see, I, 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 I also see what you're saying though, where it's like it's another expense, it's another thing. Who knows? But I think it has potential. Just the idea of AR an overlay over your games, a, a, a different kind of HUD mm-hmm. that could be baked into the games themselves. It wouldn't necessarily need to uh, have a peripheral at all. Oh, but... that reminds me of a talking point we totally glossed over, but I can mention it now that also led to the demise of strategy guides is video game design in general. Open world games now have so much quality of life built into them that you don't need a strategy guide. I can pop in Assassin's Creed Odyssey right now, and there'll be waypoints on my map yeah. with mm-hmm. a GPS location exactly how to get there with a very clear-cut directive, uh, objective list um, with the enemies highlighted in the distance that I'm supposed to kill with the the shop owner highlighted if I'm supposed to get something in the store. Yeah, in Persona, I can, above. in Persona yeah. 5 Strikers, I can like highlight an enemy. The game slows down, and it tells me what it's weak to. It's built yep. into the UI yeah. of the game. I don't need a strategy guide to tell me. I can I can live in the moment figure out exactly how to strategize around that combat encounter. But yep, yep. Cool. All right. Well, we are completely out of time. So <laughs> yes, we want to hear your thoughts on strategy guides. Do you love them? Do you hate them? Are you glad it's all moved online, or do you miss the old days of having a having a beautiful beautiful rendered and printed artwork gallery alongside your strategy guide uh we want to hear those thoughts and more and you can share those thoughts with us for termite we'll tell you right now i absolutely love a physically printed guide full of artwork i always will i still want it to this day i don't care about any of the reasons why they went away i love them i almost want to buy a cyberpunk 2077 players guide just even though i already platinum to just have it on my shelf because it's pretty to look at and i love touching books i not digital with enough, I suppose. But anyway, you can find us at 80bitpodsmash.com. It's our landing website with links to all of our podcast platforms and social media outlets, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and Reddit. You can find a Discord link in all of our show notes so you can jump into our server and yell at us, argue with us, give us your thoughts, comments, questions, concerns, and ideas. However you want to interact with us, you can go to twitch.tv slash 80bitpodsmash every Monday and Wednesday night, 8 p.m. Eastern. We have a new show on Mondays. We have a live gameplay stream on Wednesdays. You can come in and watch us and heckle us, troll us, interact with us, laugh at us, play with us, do whatever you want. We would love to have you. Our community would love to have you, and we can interact and create a space where we can enjoy the thing that we love, video games. All right, speaking of video games, we need a topic around video games next week, so we don't have anything planned out right now, but our next episode will be April 26th, and you can look forward to listening to whatever we come up with then. All right, see you next week. Bye.